This lecture presents the student t-test, uh, a very common test for asking whether an experiment made any difference. I will describe the background behind the student t-test, what it's used for, and then present an example in Excel of using the student t-test to judge the outcome of an experiment. So in the health and biological sciences especially, the student t-test is a very common uh, thing to do once you've finished an experiment. So a typical example is to ask whether or not a drug did anything in a test on, for example, human subjects. So imagine an experiment in which some group of people um, are taking a, an experimental weight loss pill. And so how does the experiment work? Everyone's weight is measured before taking the pill, and then they take the pill for a certain period of time, and then their weights are measured again. And so from that, you can see in each individual case what sort of change uh, before and after uh, in the person's weight um, happened. And to report that kind of data, you present a histogram. So a histogram is this graph here in which the number of counts, that is the number of people whose, whose weights fall, whose change in weight falls within a certain range is reported as the height of each bar. And so a histogram, you, um, you decide on uh, how wide the bins are, that is whether you're uh, reporting the ch change in weight as in this graph for every tenth of a pound, this is totally made up numbers of course, um, or you know whether you make these bars wider or narrower. But in any case, the graph reports the number of people whose um, change in weight in this example uh, falls within uh, each range. And so the question that the drug developer wants to answer is whether or not this drug did anything. And in this graph, it looks as if uh, it did something because the uh, height, uh, the, the middle of this distribution is slightly above zero, although there is a spread and some people actually had a um, negative weight loss, in other words, gained weight under the drug. And one might, in general, ask the question of whether or not these are real results or whether they could have happened by accident with the natural fluctuations of people's weight ordinarily. A related kind of experiment that one can do, which is more of an epidemiological experiment, is to simply compare two different populations and ask whether those two populations can be distinguished on the basis of something that you're measuring about them or whether they look the same. So for example, you might compare the weights of people who eat um, an American or US diet and people who eat a Mediterranean diet and ask whether or not this makes any difference in their weight. So you're not having people change their diet, you're simply comparing people with two different diets and asking whether the histograms of their weights look different enough that you can say that they're different. So here is a plot in which two histograms are overlaid and you can think of the blue one, whichever one it is, um, as being uh, in front of the, the brown one and so um, the overlap is shown in gray and it looks as if in this case the histogram of the blue data is slightly to the right of the, of the brown data. But one would like to know, is that just an accident? Did that just happen because of the natural fluctuations um, in the example in people's uh, weight or whatever quantity it is? Or is it the result of a real difference between the two populations? Those are the kinds of questions that the student t-test is designed to answer. So the way the student t-test works is to ask how likely the results of the experiment or observation are to have occurred just by chance without anything um, causative going on. And so the, 
the underlying idea of that is that all measurements have some noise in them arising from random effects. People's weights vary from person to person and from time to time. Um, and these random effects added up tend to give a uh, bell-shaped normal distribution, sometimes also called a Gaussian distribution. Um, an example of this, which I've just generated by using a random number generator, is this set of three histograms, the first of which is drawing ten numbers at random from a distribution which, if I'd drawn many, many, would make this blue curve. And you can see that this ten um, does sort of follow this blue curve from which those random numbers were drawn, um, but with some variation. I mean, the blue curve, the real average of this distribution is zero, but the brown histogram um, does have a negative average, and that just happened by accident. If I draw a hundred samples, then I get a histogram which has got a lot more detail. It's a lot closer to following the blue curve, and you can begin to see that maybe the average of this thing really should be zero, although if you compute the average of this brown uh, histogram, you'll find that it is still somewhat negative, and again, that just happened by accident. If I take a thousand samples, then the histogram is really starting to be quite faithful to the, to the blue curve, and you can see from this simple example why it's a good idea to have more uh, measurements in your data set, more people in your um, study. But that's often not possible because studies are expensive and it's hard to get subjects and so on. So oftentimes data sets are rather small in the health and biological sciences. And so these kinds of statistical tests are important. So as I said, the idea of the student test is to find out how likely it is that the measurement you observed happened by accident. And roughly the way the test works, the way you carry it out, is to compute something called the t-statistic, which is a measure of the size of the effect that you saw relative to the spread of the values that you measure. And so the t-statistic is something which, when I turn to the Excel example, will just be computed by a particular um, function or, you know, wizard panel in, in Excel, and I'll, I'll demonstrate how to do that, but I want you to understand the idea of what you're doing uh, beforehand. So this t-statistic, as I say, is a measure, for example, of the average change in uh, whatever it was you measured divided by a measure of the spread of that thing, the variance uh, divided by n square root. That's the particular kind of measure. And this t-statistic itself has a distribution for data which have zero average. Just like in this example here, the, um, the value of the average divided by the spread is moving around. Here the average is negative, here the average is slightly negative, here the average is, is very slightly negative maybe, and so the value of the average divided by the spread is a measure of how big the apparent effect is in the data. So what probability theorists are able to say is how likely it is that an effect as big as t might have happened by chance. And that's called the null hypothesis. In other words, nothing, to, nothing happened here, nothing to see. Move along, folks. Uh, this t value that you got um, had some probability of just happening by accident. And if that probability is big enough, then your experiment didn't really tell you anything. But if that value of t, that probability of that t happening by accident is very small, then it means that something made the effect that you saw. You don't know what it is, but at least there is an effect. That's the idea of the t-test. Now we're going to turn to how you do the t-test in Excel. So here I have some uh, fictitious data on um, weights of people eating an American diet and a Mediterranean diet. And so I want to analyze these data using the t-test. And as a preliminary, I just want to produce 
um, some histograms so that we can look at this data because a table is almost never the right way to look at data. So if we want to visualize it, we make a histogram. And in making a histogram, the very first thing we need to do is to set up the bins that we want to um, bin the different weight values in. So to make a list of bins, I proceed as I have before and produce a range of values by giving Excel the idea of the range and the way it's incrementing by 10 each time and then running the values up until they cover the span of the data. Now I want to create a histogram. That is a data analysis operation. You can reach that by this master menu choosing data and data analysis as I just did and scroll to here and say histogram. And at this point, you get a panel that allows you to, suggest, to select the region of data that you want. First, the actual data itself. And I click on this little gadget and choose the US data first. And then I choose the range of the bins. And then I tell Excel where it's supposed to put the histogram. And if I want it on this particular spreadsheet, then I can click Output Range. And if I click this little gadget here and highlight the top left corner of the cell where I want the histogram to go, then I press OK. And I get my histogram. I'm going to move this down a bit so that I can put a label on it to say that this is the US histogram. I repeat the same operation to make a histogram for the Mediterranean diet data. So that was data analysis, histogram, choose again the input range, this time the Mediterranean data, the bin range is the same, choose for the output range this cell right here, and the histogram for the Mediterranean data is here and I'll put a little later label on it. Now to compare these two histograms it's most convenient to put a bar chart into the spreadsheet and that is a thing that we insert. It's a, called a column chart in Excel. We want a clustered column um, because we're going to compare the two histograms. And it, uh, Excel put the uh, data that we happen to have highlighted as the set of data that was being compared here. Uh, now we want to add data to this, which we do by control clicking on the chart saying select data, adding a um, adding an additional series, uh, the name of which will be the US histogram. Um, so I'm just going to call that US diet for the name. And uh, for the Y values, what we want is the histogram itself, the frequency values.
And while I'm at it, I'm going to change the name of the of the original data to just be whoops to just be Mediterranean diet in case I should put a legend on here. And now we have our comparison. In the usual way, I can clean up this plot, um, putting a frame around, adding axis labels, and so on and so forth. And I'm going to pause the recording while I do that. So now I've prettified the graph. And, um, and you can see the comparison of the two histograms more visually. And it does look as if, in this fictitious data set, the U.S. diet has a somewhat higher mean and about the same spread as the, uh, as the blue Mediterranean diet data. Um, we'll analyze shortly whether that's statistically significant using the t-test. Before I do that, I just want to introduce a couple of other simple statistical measurements that you can make about um, a data set, data sets like these. Uh, for example, you can get the minimum value, the maximum value, the mean value, and the standard deviation um, using functions that Excel predefines. So we use built-in Excel functions to compute the minimum, maximum, mean, and standard deviation of a data set. So, for example, the min is min, and then it prompts us to put in the range of the values that we seek the minimum of. Um, it didn't go down quite far enough. Uh, there we go. Close parenthesis, hit return. Uh, the max, which is uh, max, as you might guess. Um, again, we want this range of data here. 2 to 31. The average, uh, the mean is called the average in Excel, so it's the function called average. And this range, once again, that's this. And the standard deviation, which is a function STDEV, uh, and again, uh, highlight the whole range of values that you want the standard deviation of. Um, we can actually copy these formulas sideways into the next column and it will uh, reference the column of data above uh, when we do that. Uh, these values here have got a little bit uh, too many um, too many decimal points, so I'm going to format them as a number and drop the number of decimal points down to one. So that um, is a quick way of just characterizing these data. It's clear that the mean is slightly bigger for the um, fictitious US data set and the spreads are hmm, similar on the order of 20 each. And so those are descriptive statistics of the data sets, but now what we seek is the answer to the question, how likely is the difference between these two data sets to have occurred by chance? So to do that, we return to this panel we were looking at before, data analysis. And we want a t-test. And there are different kinds of t-tests. And the kind that we want is a two-sample test, because we're looking at two samples, that is, of the uh, people who, um, in this example, ate an American diet and different people who ate a Mediterranean diet. And we're going to assume um, in this case, that the spreads in those two data sets are the same, and, and I, I know that they are because they're fictitious data and I created them that way. 
Um, and that is a t-test to sample assuming equal variances. So we get a wizard as usual, which asks us to input the range of the first data set. And that's the raw data, not the histogram that we looked at to visualize it. So here's our first data set. And then the range of the second data set. And then we're asked to say, what is the hypothesized mean difference between the two sets? And we're going to say the null hypothesis. That is, we suppose, as a skeptic, that there's no difference at all. And so the mean difference that we hypothesize is zero. And finally, we have to decide where we want the t-test results to go. And we specify on this sheet an output range, that is a place on, this, on, the, uh, on the sheet where we want the answer to go. And we select that to be over here. And now we press OK. And we get this table of results, um, which take a bit of interpreting. And first, to be able to read the results. So first we see that this table provides us with some descriptive statistics, the mean of the two uh, sets, the variance, which is the square of the standard deviation. These mean values agree with the mean values that we computed down here, 175.4 and 165.1. And um, each set of data has 30 members and so forth. The thing that we are uh, seeking here is, first of all, this is the value of the t statistic that was computed. And there is a value at which um, this could happen by chance with a probability of 5%, and those values are this 1.67 and 2.00. Now, it could happen by chance that one distribution was to the right of the other or to the left of the other, and if you allow for both those possibilities, that is called the two-tail uh, situation. And so this T statistic could have been as big as 2 in that case. And so the probability that that would happen by accident is this 0.063, etc. In other words, 6.3%. So that um, these data could have happened by chance with that kind of probability. That's what the t-test says. Another common form of the t-test is when you have done a before versus after experiment. In other words, your two data sets are related um, element by element because they are, for example, the weight before and after of the subject in the trial of a weight loss drug. So uh, they are not unrelated data sets. They are related. And so the change is relevant. That is, the change person by person is uh, an important thing. So here I have built a spreadsheet that has uh, some fictitious data of this kind, in which here are the before and after weights, and here are the changes just computed as the difference between the two columns. I have built histograms for the before and the after, um, and you can see that the change here is quite modest. The before are the blue and the after are the, are the um, brown or orange uh, columns, and the blue does seem to lie slightly to the right of the orange. Um, and so now we're going to employ, employ the, uh, the t-test uh, to see whether or not this change is statistically significant. So to do that, we go again to the data analysis panel, to the t-test. Now what we have is a paired sample, paired to sample, that is the the subjects before and after um, are those measurements are paired. So we choose that panel. We are asked for the range of the before data. 
and the range of the after data. The hypothesized mean difference, again, will make the skeptics' assumption that there was no change uh, that was real and that anything we're seeing is just a fluctuation. Uh, and we choose where this um, t-test result will go. So we'll just put it right over here. And press OK. And then we get our answers. So now, um, the T statistic it computes is a quite a large number, and you'll notice that it's much larger than the, the critical values that are the boundary of what might have happened by chance at the 5% level, that alpha of 0.05 that we left in the panel previously. That's the degree of confidence that we specify we want this experiment to have. So we could have only had a value of T as big as about 2, by accident. Um, but we have a value of t, this t statistic, which is bigger than 9. And so the probability that that would happen by accident in either direction, this two-tail result, that the blue histogram will either be shifted a little to the right or a little to the left of the orange one by accident, is extremely small. Uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 10th. Well, that means these data are highly significant. This is a real effect this fictitious drug has had. We can see why that is if we construct a histogram for the changes. So I had this column that I put in here of the changes for the purpose of looking at them directly. So, first of all, we notice that they are all negative and that the mean of them is about minus 16. And so the, these are the descriptive statistics, the mean, the max, etc., of the changes themselves. And then I've created a histogram here by the same procedure as before, specifying a list of bins, constructing a histogram, and then I've made also a graph of those changes, and you can see that that histogram, indeed, all of the changes are basically negative. And, and that's why this is a so much more significant measurement than the previous one of the comparison of the slight differences in weight of an unrelated population of people eating an American and a Mediterranean diet. Um, here, we can look at the individual change of every single person in the study, and if they're all negative, well, then it stands to reason that, um, that the fictitious uh, drug is having an effect. And so a paired study like that is much more effective at finding um, small effects uh, with you know, reliability than an epidemiological study where you just compare two populations of unrelated people.